be hello. Officially, hello, welcome to this workshop. My name is Stéphane Vermette. I've been an ordained minister within the United Church of Canada. Oh, sorry, Eric, you have to present me. Sorry. I'm so <laughs> you. Be alone. That's okay. Me. That's okay. Go on. Um, sorry. So that's all right. Um, so it's my honor to present Stéphane Vermette because he, uh, uh, he and I have had the opportunity to work together uh, quite a bit over the last uh, number of years, but I was actually at Stefan's ordination um, um, back, was it about 12, 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago? So we're talking 15 years. Yeah, 15 years ago. And, uh, and Stefan has, uh, has, has, has been in ministry for, uh, for those, for that period of time, but um, is now the minister of uh, a new project called Saint Claire, which is a, a francophone online only community of faith that began in May of, 20, of 2020. And uh, he'll be telling us a little bit about that experience. Um, and, uh, and it's an honor because he, he and I again get to work on this particular project because I as the uh, French ministries person for the general council office um, get to um, get to work with him on on this particular project as well so it's great to have him uh, share a little bit about his learnings and about uh, about what's going on in this ministry that I'm finding quite uh, fascinating and dynamic as well so take it away Stefan. Sorry so hello my name is Stefan Vermette and yes being ordained in 2006, the pronoun I'm using is he and him. Les pronoms en français que j'utilise est il et lui. So this presentation will be in English, but if you have, si vous avez des questions ou des commentaires en français, on va être fluide et on va très bien s'organiser là-dessus. And uh, last uh, thing, um, I would like to invite you, if it's not done, to turn off your microphone. And if you wish, it's not an obligation, but let you. I just want to share that turning off your camera uh, during the presentation could offset 90% of your carbon footprint. And I will not take it personal. If you do it, I will speak and then we will have time for question and sharing. So. So let us, I just want to begin by stating that I'm 51 years old. I'm not from generation Y or Z. I'm not a digital native. I was not born with one of these in my hand, like my son is, he's 11. And for him, a phone looked like this. I'm stating this because all that I will have to, all that I will talk about is, was not a given for me. I had to learn it. Sometimes it was difficult. There was a lot of frustration. There was, there was a lot of unholy word <laughs> to all of this. So don't worry if you're not necessarily comfortable with this topic. And it makes me think of one of my former, a former, someone in the former congregation who used to tell me over and again, where some see a problem, others see an opportunity. You might have heard it before, but where some see a problem, others sees an opportunity. This pandemic might have been the biggest problem of our lifetime. For sure, church, but also for a personal point of view, we were not ready for it. We did not see it coming. And in the matters of days, we have been forced outside our zone of comfort. We were expelled from the ways we have been doing church sometimes since our birth. And we were not ready to face this problem. And yet, and yet in just a few days, 
we adapt. We discovered new words like Zoom, Facebook Live, streaming on YouTube. And if we look into the first few weeks, honestly, uh, it was a bit messy. We made many mistakes. It was far, far from perfect. And still, we remain faithful to our mission to be the church of God in this world. We discovered or rediscovered that maybe we cannot go to church, but we still can be the church. And it's in this context that I received a phone call from Eric just a week after Easter 2020. And many congregations, French, English, across the country, maybe it's the same in your context, many congregations notice the presence of new people at worship services when we move to the internet. And the question that arose was, what will we do with them since we're about to go back in our building in a few weeks? We were so naive <laughs> a year ago, but we had this question. Do we say, oh, that was nice to see you and then bye-bye? Or do we try to build something? And Eric with others got this idea. What if we build something new, something different, a community of faith online that will remain online after the end of the pandemic? When I heard that, I got very excited right away because all up to this point, there were community of faith in French in what, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Sherbrooke, Quebec City. Maybe I forgot one or two, but that was basically it. But with this project, we erase the issue of geography because they're Francophone across this country. And the traditional mindset, well, we need to create something in every city. But if we erase the problem of geography, people from all over the country can connect to one single place. Also, there was always this question like other community, people with mobility issues that now can join to a community of faith, join worship, join activities. So we said, let's do it and let's start. And we realized that Pentecost was only in four weeks. And we said, well, that's a great symbol. That would be a powerful statement, you know, reach out people. And at that point, to be honest, we did not have any money. We did not have the official authorization from the United Church of Canada. Personally, I barely had a clue what I was doing. No matter, we jumped. We made this leap of faith. And four weeks later, Edelise saint Lain had its first worship services. I said we barely had a clue. Um, I've been reading emergent uh, texts on emergent churches for the last 10 years. Um, I also had access to a survey of, uh, made by Ministry in French in 2019 about the religious practices and the spirituality of people living in Quebec. The first reading was a bit disappointed saying two thirds of the people did not want to do and don't want not even close to be interested to organize church. And then I come switch my mindset. Well, we have one third that is kind of interested. Well, 
to use a business model vocabulary, well, that's our market. <laughs> that's where we need to invest. And among those, uh, those individuals, what emerged very strongly is we don't want to be told what to believe. We don't want the correct interpretation. What we want is to explore, to engage faith. We want to have meaningful conversation that has a daily impact in our lives. And I will take a few seconds to welcome everyone who is joining us. So I just give a little bit of what we're doing at Idli saint Clair, but if there's part missing, there will be a time of question after to fill the blank. So thank you for being with us. So understanding that people want to engage, they want to interact, we decide to build a worship service that way, not come to worship and then there's gonna be activity where you can engage your faith. No, let's build a worship service around sharing and interaction. Sharing our stories, sharing who we are, sharing what we believe, because I believe everybody got something to bring, something to teach in a way. You can have learn something from books, from theological college, from life experience, Everyone has something to offer. And when you start to talk about your own experience, you cannot go wrong. If someone say, well, that's how I feel the, holy, the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, I cannot say, no, 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 you're wrong. That's not the way it is. You cannot go wrong. The other part, interaction, well, that's the reality of internet and social media these days. You post something, something answer. In a worship, traditional worship service, it's a one-way communication. The worship leaders speak and you listen. And that's often about it. What if we have interactive moment during the worship service? For example, we read scripture every week and then we stop and I ask people, what do you like about this text? What do you dislike about this text? Is there something that caught your attention? Is there something that, I don't know, you're uncomfortable with? And for 15, 20 minutes, we open the mics, we open the chat box and people speak. And then I present my reflection which is not the answer to all, but not, but just another point of view to this conversation. When I shared that with a colleague, a minister, he, well, he was a man, so I, but not identifying anyone, he said, well, how do you control the conversation? And the answer that came out immediately out of my mouth is you play the game or you don't play the game. You cannot say to people, interact, share, but as long as I'm comfortable with it, that it's the official theology of our church. No, you open the mics, people share. And Basically, the rule is as long as you attack nobody or you, I don't know, start to proclaim neo-Nazi propaganda, it's fair game. And we discover that people sometimes disagreed. Someone would say something about the text and someone else said, I'm not sure I agree with you because, and then we have this ongoing conversation that sometimes they have to stop because we need to continue. But I discovered those that people really enjoy and cherish this, this safe space because they can be speak their truth and they don't want to lose it. They don't want to mess with it. 
I speaking about the participant, well, who's coming? Honestly, at the beginning, there were some people, they were afraid that I would, or Saint Claire would steal the sheep of other congregation. But quite rapidly, um, I was, we discovered that was not the case. And as um, Andrea Irwin in following embodied discipleship in a digital age available at UCRD among other places, very interesting. She said, the people interested in digital ministry like Edely saint Clair, and it proved to be true, are most often people at the fringe of the church. People who don't find their own place in a traditional congregation. They're looking for something else. And they're at saint Clair, almost no one belong to the United Church of Canada. They will define their, themselves as Roman Catholic, Anglican, uh, Christian. Many don't know how to define themselves. And for them, the denomination does not really matter. The fact it's a United Church of Canada ministry, they come to St. Clair because they find something they're looking for they're telling me here, we're not judged. We're not told what to do, how to believe. And that's a relief. Now, we, after 18 months, uh, we have an average of almost 20 people coming every Sunday. Uh, our worship service are in the evening at 7.30 Eastern time. So um, an average of 20 people. Most of them are between 20 and 50. There's people up to 80, but mostly between 20 and 50. Uh, half and half male and female. Uh, but our ministry goes way much. Uh, it's more than Sunday uh, worship attendance. If you belong to a congregation, you know that you fill a statistical report and you have to say how many people on Sunday morning, uh, how many contributor. I don't think we're asked with how many people are we doing ministry that we contact, maybe change life. That's why statistic about Sunday morning or Sunday evening attendance says part of the story. But I can say also that we have 80 person on our newsletter. We put sermons and clips on YouTube. And in the last 12 months, we have 400 hour, hours sorry, of views. Our Facebook page has 230 subscribers. All of those people who do not show up on Sunday, we're connecting with them and we're doing ministry with them. Of course, it's not always been easy. Uh, as you can imagine, we're some kind of UFO in the universe of the United Church of Canada. As we were not ready for this pandemic, uh, there was nothing planned for a project like that in the manual, for example. And it brought many challenges. I can give you two examples, not to criticize, but just very concrete examples. First, this community of faith is attached to which region? It sounds silly, but which region to belong? Well, where it is where your building is. Well, when you don't have a building, <laughs> when you're on internet, what do you do? So we talked and said, well, we're reaching out to Francophone. The wide majority of Francophone live in the province of Quebec. So let's go to Nakanaga. And then we've been asked, well, yes, Stefan, but you live in Ottawa. It, this is not Nakanaga. I said, well, since when we're the minister live has something to do with the region the church belonged to. It was not planned. Another 
example is, I would say, the traditional model in the former time, I would say. Uh, maybe some of you remember the VIM, Venture in uh, Ministry. You send 30 family in a suburb, or you have a few in new suburb, they organize their church, uh, they elect um, a council, and they build this traditional model. One building, one congregation, one minister. Well, in this case, this ministry, it began with me, me, and me. <laughs> That was it. No members, no volunteers, nothing. What's it's called in church uh, lingo? A church plant. Well, that brings a bunch of questions. How do we handle money? How do we receive money? Who makes decisions? We had the great privilege to reach Trinity United Church in Montreal and say, let's build a partnership. Not so we become one of your ministries or one of your projects. Let's build a partnership equal to equal. And instead of signing this big juicy check, which by the way, I will collect yours after the end of this workshop. So instead of this, <laughs> big check, they gave us what I would say, something more precious. They gave us services. Their treasurer is now our treasurer. Their council is our council. When it's time to make decision that has legal implication, they can do it. Their MNP is our MNP. And we also using our CRA uh, numbers to issue receipt. It's all legal, don't worry. It's not been always easy, but we work trying to figure it out. We had great partners that help us. But as if you were there for the keynote this afternoon with Carolina Casta, she kind of said, and, and I, that's also a reality for any new project, the more time you spend of figure out technicality, administration, polity, the less time you're doing ministry. So we're growing. We have now the support, the financial support of La Table des Ministères en Français, the Canada region, and also from the foundation of the United Church of Canada. We're very grateful. Um, to pay the expenses that which basically is my salary. Um, and we have, we're building a basis of donor. And I would say we're close to reach one quarter of our budget with donation after 18 months. But still, I'm half pay, uh, half time. I'm paid half time for working full time to develop a new model of ministry. United Church. My last point of my presentation, I would like to invite you to step back a little to look at the big picture. I think the expression is stop looking at the trees and looking at the forest. The pandemic changed the way to be the church since, I would say, since our birth, as I said. We have this traditional uh, view, one congregation, one building, one minister. And for many of our congregation, they cannot wait to go back to what they're comfortable with, to what they knew. I'm tempted to say go back to 2019, but I think in fact, they want to go back to 1981, 40 years ago, because for some, nothing changed in the last 40 years. Society changed, but they keep doing exactly the same thing. And that's an option. That's a choice. Another possibility is what 
we call the hybrid model, the hybrid church, the new buzzword. And for, I'm not saying everyone, but for many, it's putting a camera in your sanctuary, streaming the service, you do the service exactly as you do it, and you don't engage with the people watching at home. That is called television. And that exists since the 80s. That too, it's fair. It's another option. A third option is what I call digital ministry, to really engage people on the internet and social media. Some might say, hey, we have a Facebook page. What's, what's the big deal? <laughs> Putting your poster of your rummage sale on Facebook is excellent communication, but it's not really ministry. People today use this, they use this, they use this, and sometimes at the same time, all together. We might like it, we might not like it, but it's a fact. They spend hours every day online. So the question is, what we're going to do about this? Are we pretend it does not exist? Or we try to reach out people? Give you an example. In July, I start a TikTok account. And I knew nothing about TikTok. I've been told, I said, that's a good place to go. I said, okay, I download the app. I'm starting to watch what is done. And when I said that to a few people, they, they start laughing, said, what, what are you going to do? Like dance, like a teenager? Like, come on, you're 51. I said, but I was looking to TikTok and I discovered that evangelical and conservative and traditional Christian, Christian are there. They have invested that place. And TikTok is the most downloaded app in the world, before Facebook, before anything else. That's the place. Those conservative, for theological point of view, are there. And for the millions who are spending time, they are defining Christianity. People think Christianity is that. And when they encounter us, they said, oh, I did not know Christian could be that way. He said, of course, we're not there. We're very good as United Church to have social media policies about all the things you cannot do. But we don't have a social media strategy. We don't have a digital minister. We have communication, but not ministry. So my constatation, my, my, what I see is as an institution, we're not doing much. And we expect that ministers ordain or lay will do it on their own, on their own time. And I believe, just to end, this could be our Pentecostal moment. We have a great message. I believe that deepest of my core, we have a great message to offer to the world. Radical love, radical inclusivity. And I feel like we're like the disciples on the day of Pentecost. We have this knowledge. We open the door and then what? We expect people to come in and when they're not coming in, we're starting bitching about those young people. Or we get outside. We get where the people are. In the story of Pentecost to the marketplace, the disciples were able to speak in such a way that people get it. They understood the message. For us, our Pentecostal moment is maybe to go online and speak in such a way that people understand. I believe, and I'm sorry if I will shock people if I say that, 
I believe the biggest evangelization field today is online, on the internet, on social media. So do we have the courage to develop and sustain financially this new field of ministry? Do we have the courage to consider digital ministry as real and as important than congregational ministry? Do we have the courage to make this leap of faith and see the opportunity just in front of us. I will stop here. I think I spoke enough. And in the spirit of what we're trying to do at St. Claire and also in digital ministry, offer you a time to share or interact. And like I ask, what did you like? What did you dislike? Is there something that caught your attention? There is something you want to share? Let's open the microphone. Let's open the chat box and um, see what emerged because this is our time. So what would you like to say at this point? Uh, I I see if you could raise your hand on Zoom. I see Peter, and I don't see all of you. But uh, if you can raise your hand or use the chat box, it would be great. So Peter, what do you want to say? We're listening. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation. First of all, thank you. Um, I'd like to say a little more about. Um, where we came from and where we are. Um, we, um, I said we formed a conversation group for Sunday mornings and uh, we call it a holy listening circle. We have about, well, during COVID, we had about 25 to 30 participants every week. We had a mailing list of about um, 70, but not everybody came every week. And uh, we, pick a, a scripture um, from the lectionary about uh, five days in advance of the Sunday and tell everybody what the scripture is and ask them to reflect on it during the week. Then during the, during the Sunday morning session, one of us will introduce the scripture, trying to answer the question, what did it mean then? and then break into small groups. Uh, and the, the question put in the small groups is, what does it mean to you now? And we have a, a discipline that we follow there that we call holy listening. People speak one at a time in order um, with no interruption, no argumentation, no correction. Um, and when everybody has spoken once, there's a second round where you may respond to anything which is evoked in you from what you heard in the first round. So since, uh, since the physical building has reopened, uh, numbers have shrunk a little bit. We're now about 18 to 20. Some people have chosen to return to uh, the physical building. Some have said they're not going back. Some of the people who've joined us who found us by word of mouth are shut-ins, like you, like you mentioned, they've got mobility issues, or they're not from our city. They've come from somewhere else. And um, we're in good shape to maintain what we have, but the, the question that I have has to do with scalability and inviting new people to join. Because we meet on, on Zoom, we make no demands on the resources of the local congregation which spawned us. We don't take any time from the ministers. We don't take any money from there. We, we run on um, lay participation and the time that we put in. And we're scalable. Uh, our, our Zoom uh, accounts would allow us to 
have up to 100 people in our group without going up a level in <laughs> Zoom. Uh, so for 20 bucks a month, we can run this, this ministry. Uh, the small groups uh, are six to eight people. So there's lots of chance to interact um, after our, and the, the uh, groups dismiss themselves from the small group uh, with a benediction which is provided in advance. So they can take us as long as they, they like. Now, the question that I have is, is about how we might extend the invitation to more people. Um, at the moment, the only way people find us is because they're part of the uh, physical congregation, the congregation based in the one church building, uh, or through word of mouth. So I'm curious about how you, how people find you, how the 18 to 20 people who show up on a Sunday evening found you and how they make that connection. That's my first question. And my second question is, uh, how, do you, how do you extend the ministry beyond that one hour or however long it is of, of meeting into things like social justice activities? Because I don't, I don't see quite how to do that. So any any insight you have, I'd I'd be very grateful for, Stefan. First of all, I'm grateful you share your the ministry you're involved with. Uh, I find this exciting. Uh, I wish we had time to speak more about it. Um, how to grow? Um, I would say. You invite, 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 you invite. And, and that's the only way. And, and something I notice, uh, I'm not a United Church native, I would say. I think in the United Church, we're so, we're not like them kind of mentality. You know, the evangelical are doing this. We're not like them. Um, like I said, we have a darn good message to share with the word. If I can say to my neighbor, I have a great car and I really like that model. Maybe you should consider this. You should be able to find a way to share. I belong to a great activity. Remember, I remember a workshop. I went to, and it was people trying to convince other people to go to church. And they were all saying, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. And then the um, facilitator said, talk about your experience. Talk about what you're gaining. I'm going to this place and I'm gaining this. This is what it brings to my life. This is what I like about it. And then you let the spirit do the rest of the work. You know, the bring a friend to church. Am I supposed to kidnap someone to force? No. Tell your story. Once again, when you're sharing your story, you cannot go wrong. You don't know theology. That's not a big deal. You're sharing. I'm going to this group. I like it because of this. And it helped me during the pandemic because of that. Do you want to hear more about it? No? Okay. Fair game. And then publicity. You can use, yeah, you have a Facebook. You can use a Facebook. You have Twitter. You have a, a website. And I believe there's always someone you know that knows someone that knows someone who are looking for a project like yours. That I believe that. It's just that they don't know. So to develop this culture of we're gonna talk about our project and we will not apologize because this is something good. That would be my two cents about it. Don't justify yourself, share. I saw that 
Ralph Rose raised this in. Is it, do you still have something you would like to add? <clears throat> oh, just at the start, you said, uh, you know, what was your reaction to your, what you were saying? And I was just saying that connection with, uh, with Pentecost really was a neat uh, connection for me. It's, uh, and, and there was, and in that story, there was fear involved because <laughs> it was all new. And I, I, I guess I've experienced a lot of that, but um, <clears throat> that was all I was going to say. But just riffing off of, uh, was it Peter? Or? Peter, yeah. Yeah. Just uh, we're in Red Deer Lake, uh, United Church in Calgary, but, um, <clears throat> and, P and going back into, in-person service, but I'm part of the ministry and it's trying to stay online. And we have about 20 followers are attending on Sunday, but then the rest of the week, it goes up to like 80 or 90. So some, and just, I'd like to know who those people are. Or how do we interact with them? Or, and I guess it is through Facebook and Twitter and TikTok, but that's uh that's the scary part but just to i guess like what you're saying just jump in and uh try and connect but how, how do you like like the people you meet with sunday like for the rest of the week you connect with them and interact with them too or are they just some yes some no um this kind of ministry once I, like I'm saying, I'm talking about people at the fringe of the institu institutional, sorry, church. So Peter asked, sorry, I forgot, you know, how do you do social justice work? The wide majority are already doing it from what I notice. So the way I see it is not to organize them, but to put, to rekindle the passion, to put a log in the fire, go to the world, continue to do this. If someone is working, his job is to help people to find diesel, decent rental uh, apartment, something that large city across Canada is facing. He's doing social work. So when it comes to church, he wants to pray. He wants faith. And then I said to him, and of course, we exchange emails. And we have once a month an activity. It's about faith. We call it, it's a pun in French. It's called une fois par mois. Uh, one time, it's a pun on one time a month and one faith a month. It's the same word. And we talk about faith, of course, related to a subject but it's about faith. And what I discover with the people interested in often digital ministry, that's what they're looking for. They want to engage faith that has a connection to real life, but they don't want, sometimes it's, sometimes, sometimes in the United Church it feels, oh, let's find a good cause and oh, uh, we will say a prayer at the beginning in the Bible, the scripture, so kind of look at the church. Then said, let's talk about faith and let's see where it leads us. And you can do it on Tuesday morning, on Wednesday afternoon, on Friday evening. So, and, and you try to engage people that way. Of course, like I say, TikTok, the people on TikTok, probably will not come to worship service. So it's this mindset that what is important, it's butts in the pews, trying to dissociate that. We're doing ministry with different people that are connecting from different ways. And that's okay. And trying, some people will have 10 minutes to watch your recorded version of your sermon. Some people have 30 seconds for a summary of your sermon in three sentences. That's okay. So 
in the spirit of Pentecost is not expecting the people to adapt to the disciple. No, it's the disciples that get to the market. They adapt to the crowd. And yes, it's scary. And I'm scared often about new things that sometimes I said, why the hell I tried this? You know, everything was working. And then I come with a new idea said, how stupid I am to have this idea. But it's seeing the opportunity in front of me said, let's try. And if it fails, it fails. But at least I've tried. Uh, Irene. Oh, hello again from the uh, a few Hi. weeks ago. Yeah, Ralph and I are both from Red Deer Lake uh, United, and we met you before on the What's Next conversations, mm. which are super wonderful um, for helping us connect, especially around either hybrid church or online ministry and stuff. So, but um, I have a, a couple of comments and a question or two. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I really appreciate your, your comments about us having to us having to do the moving, us having to do the adapting. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, and in meeting people where they're at. And back at the beginning of the uh, of, of COVID, a few months in, I attended a, a, a conference online and I can't even remember what it was called now but it was all around um ministry online and it wasn't United Church at all but um it it, it one of the things one of the talks I heard there they were talking about uh, likening this ministry to um they, they went to Paul they were looking at the ministry of Paul and the Roman roads and they were saying that in Paul's day, the Roman roads were built for a very, very political, you know, empire building kind of reason. But Paul in, inhabited that and, and the other disciples inhabited that and, and used it um, to have the means to make connections that they didn't have any other way and so he was likening the internet to that and I've, I've that really that really sort of switched a lot of lights on for me but when you're talking about well justice but even in terms of worship and everything and and you were talking about the united church um in particular we also are not from a, a historically United Church background, um, but it, it just seems to me that some of our problem might have to do with us wanting recognition um, for the work that we're doing in justice, being able to label it as ours as opposed to everybody else. And what you were saying about the United Church, you know, is being a kind of that sort of we're, we're us and they are them. And, and anytime we're doing that, are, are we not being, it, it's like we're trying to be exclusive about being inclusive. And, and, and we want the, the recognition that, that we're the ones that, that do that. And, and I guess I'm, I'm just struggling with that a, a whole lot because I think that part of what motivates us is, is the requirement of measuring uh, numbers. Uh, you know, in bums in pews is the way we've kind of done that measuring and um like doesn't all of that structurally don't we all have to start addressing that as the united church of canada to take some of those kind of parameters off the table 
because sometimes we, we're, we're trying to put our names on things so that we've got something so that we can put it into reports and say that we're justifying being here or, or paying somebody or, or getting money or something like that. And I'm just finding that really problematic and, and difficult because it seems a lot of the online stuff has to do with collaboration. We, we have to build avenues that way in order to connect um, more broadly. So I'm just wondering with justice work and online work and all this kind of thing, do you have suggestions for how we or, 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 or thoughts or are, are there any recommendations going to the United Church generally um, to, to try to move us structurally to be able, you know, do we have to have new wineskins or can we, can we make the old ones stretch or can we take out the pieces that aren't serving us anymore? But I don't know how to do that. And yet I find you, you say it beautifully. There's a part we want recognition. We want to be in charge. Maybe in 1950s, I don't know, I was not there, but there was a given that the church will run the food bank, for example, or, or do this kind of things in their own community. We do not live in this world anymore. No. So why do we cling to this once again? We have less people and we want to do more. No, we have to do different. So if it's the city that run the food bank, wonderful, there's a food bank. So maybe for a community of faith is to go to the food bank and said, how can we help? And even if we're not recognized, who cares? The people are fed. So maybe to focus on the mission. And one of my favorite expression I got for myself is faith is our business. We do not exist to maintain building. We do not exist to um, send people in poor country our raison d'etre. We are a church. Faith and spirituality should always be at the center. And then translate and, and be incarnate in our world. So when we step back and said, okay, if we look at this, not from an institution, not as what it should be, not as what it was, but as faith people, what can we do? And how can we empower others who are doing amazing thing? We're not the United Way. We are the United Church. And sometimes we forget that. But you, I think you got it. You got it without knowing it. We know those things. Maybe it's time to say, yeah, let's try that. <laughs> let's try that. Can I add one other question? Um, over the last few months, I've noticed in, in our area, and it appears to be that these platforms are basically present in, in many, many areas, if not most, and, and they're like neighborhood chats you know where people come on to the chat and they they can say some pretty nasty things to one another too but they there's also a lot of just um sort of grassroots supporting of one another in a neighborhood you can't say anything um that is overtly christian or about your church or promoting your church kind of thing on on these forums but what i'm noticing is that that you can that that you can see needs there because people are used to sharing their needs there you know 
I've lost my dog, my kid's gone missing. Um, somebody, somebody stole my car. And, and people out there are responding. And I'm thinking, how do we, I mean, I've just joined and, you know, and I just try and monitor stuff and, and interact with people and all that kind of stuff there. But it just seems to me like a, a harvest field that, that we could go play in or something. And, and I was just wondering if you had any experience with that or comment? It's just to try and offer. I have friends who know me from my youth and teenage year where nobody would believe I would become an ordained minister, like not even close. <laughs> Those days were something else. Anyway, um, and during the pandemic, they reached out to me. Uh, I said, what's going on? And they knew that my minister and I offer some, some message. On TikTok, I would say about 70% of my uh, capsule are answering questions of people they're asking me. How do I pray? How can I believe in God and stop being worried? How should I understand the book of Revelation? And, and so on. And say, if it's not the job of a minister, ordain or lay. That's really being the church and answering. And sometimes I say to people, I will listen. And, and sometimes, I don't know about you, but people start to open up with me and I'm waiting for the bus. And I don't have a collar, but, and I will listen and say, would you like that I pray for you? Not now, but like later. And sometimes people will say yes. And sometimes people will say no. But if you don't try, what's, I think it's um, very Canadian. Wayne Gretzky, I think that says, if you don't shoot, hundred percent sure you won't score that's a given but if you shoot there's a possibility so in this forum in this conversation if you try some people will say no they will laugh at you yes it's scary like the story of pentecost peter start to talk and what some say he is drunk he is a fool he kept doing it, and at the end, some people joined. Not all the people, but some. So I think we need to move beyond this fear. It's still there. I still feel it <laughs> often, but reminding myself, if I don't try, nothing will happen. God depend on me. I think it's the song, We Are the Ends and the Feet of God. There's a song I think about that. I hope I'm not making it this up. God depend on us to do something to build this realm of God. It will not happen by itself. I'm doing my part. Irene, you're doing your part. And Monique, Fesa Parti, Gary is doing her part. We don't have to do it all. We don't have to do the same. But we all have a ministry. We all have a part to play. Um, don't go, Gretzky said, don't go where the puck is. Go where the puck is going to be. That's true. Um, and it's difficult. It's going against the grain. It's daring to try something and being frustrated because nobody understands what you're trying to say. And, and, and you, you, you go against, and there's some churches, some congregation that have millions in their bank account, and they have five people worshiping there. And us, we have more people, and we're fighting like crazy to have money. That's part of the life, I guess. Uh, I think I see people uh, writing things, maybe. It's 
something else. En français aussi, si vous voulez. Thanks, Stefan. One of the things that we talked about early on in the project was that we we realized that going through the doors of a church is also an incredible barrier for people. Um, it's a scary thing to do. And those who actually make it through the church doors are pretty um, unusual. There are not many of them. Those who can sit back and watch to feel comfortable and then start to take a step forward it's sometimes the best way to sort of do evangelism is to is to show them <laughs> that it's possible and that warms them up to the possibility of taking the next steps and i think that that was one of the sort of founding principles that we had with saint cloud was we could we could let people see first right they didn't actually have to walk through the doors to see what was going on <laughs> they could they could sit on facebook be anonymous watch say, oh, okay, this is something that, you know, maybe I can get involved in, right? Yeah, we're on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. And there's one person that really told tell me that it started to watch on Facebook Live just to see if we were not crazy people, if we were normal people. And after a few weeks, he decided to dare to go on Zoom. And, and he told me not that long ago, he said, if someone said to me that I would go to church on a regular basis, I would say to him, um, okay, you're effing crazy. Okay. <laughs> That's what he told me. But it needed that because there was so much baggage with the word church. Once again, we let others define what church is, sadly. And then he went on Zoom anonymously. Nobody knew he was there on Zoom. At, oh, not on Zoom. On Facebook Live, you just have the, the, the number of people who are watching. And it's anonymous. And then some move to Zoom. Some are very comfortable to to be on Facebook Live. And once again, we adapt to their needs. Because sometimes said, oh, you want to come to church? Well, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to become a member, you have to join a committee. Some people are happy about that. Some people, then that's not what they're looking for. So it's on us to deliver to their needs. And I'm, and I'm glad that Eric got this ID, this suggestion fairly early. So he said, okay, yeah, there's multiple door. You can, well, you don't walk into a building, but you can connect with this community of faith. And it's all good. It's all good. We have someone who is in Marseille. He's watching our video every week. He's writing me an email every week. In a traditional United Church context, is he a member? In this context, who cares? <laughs> He's engaged. What else can I can ask for more? He cares. He's there. So, so once again, you erase geography. You try to erase all those hoops you have to jump through. Come. Like Jesus says, are you the Messiah? Uh, you're waiting for and Jesus said come and see well why not having this kind of philosophy in our church come and see you know you come once and never come back at least you have one experience maybe if it's your only experience it's positive great you want to come back I'm delighted it's the open house <clears throat> philosophy you're always open Peter what do you want to add uh, I wanted to ask whether the Anglophone United Church is taking any notice of what you're doing and might have plans to, to uh, do something similar, or, as I fear, are they too invested in the one building 
one minister model, which is tied to geographic boundaries? Two things. Ministry in French is so small that it has to be creative and find ways to survive and thrive. Secondly, I hope the wider United Church would notice because let's put it extension of what we're doing. If you're a small congregation, you want to amalgamate, your dance partners are your neighbor. You might be, you might not be in sync theologically or neighborhood who are two different neighborhood. And sometimes it was not a good result. Sometimes it was good. But now with this kind of concept, I can't imagine a congregation in Eastern Saskatchewan, a congregation in Northern Manitoba, a congregation in Eastern Ontario that said, let's come together. We struggle to attract a minister, let's come together. Let's try to build something and let's hire one of those ministers that live in Toronto that want, maybe will visit us once in a while, like the good old circuit rider in the former time of the Methodist church. That is something, like I said often, technology is there. Mm, not always perfect. Canada is a big country and we have to acknowledge that. But for the wide majority, technology is there. What we lack is imagination and courage. This model that we have to belong to one region. If you find people are the same mind, why not? Why not? I'm so, I, and I'm sure I'm saying that that some... Um, region uh, executive uh, minister probably would pull their air, but why not? It's, we erase this limitation. Uh, I remember at one general council, we were talking about uh, difficulty to have someone distributing communion a few uh, uh, years ago that led to uh, sacramental elders. And someone said, we don't have a theological problem. We have a geographical problem in Canada. You know, those remote place that struggle to bring minister. Well, remote from where? That's, that's another debate. But those places that struggle to bring minister because it's part-time, one-third time. Let's, let's get together. Let's find partners really ready to imagine something wherever they are, and let, let's be creative. That's what I hope the United Church would get a little more. It's, I'm not saying everybody should do it that way, but we should move from one size fit all ID, that the congregation has to be that way. And if you're not that way, you're a problem you need to fit in the box. Instead of saying, why not? Monique, qu'est-ce que tu aimerais dire? Oublie pas d'ouvrir ton micro. There are francophones all over Canada, and I was wondering if you know uh, of francophones that uh, come to Sainte Claire from uh, um, British Columbia or from. Sask Saskatchewan or Winnipeg or, or Saint Boniface or whatever. Uh, we have someone coming from uh, Victoria for some activity. We have people from Toronto. We have people from Nova Scotia, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. Uh, there's people uh, sometimes from um, Val d'Or. Val d'Or, there's no United Church. Not mm -hmm. French, not English, not thing and he can connect oh, not every week but he can connect so yes it's still a struggle to reach out people and sometimes try to convince other congregation to publicize what we're yeah. doing because once again they're afraid to lose their own people we cannot afford to lose people well what i'm saying we're sunday night and there's people who are going to church Sunday morning to their own church and they come 
worship with us on Sunday evening. I said, wow, two services one day, that's, that's faith, <laughs> that's commitment. But and how, do you, how, do you, how do you know where they come from if they sit back and... I ask. <laughs> I ask. Um, and, and, and some don't want to say, and, and that's fair. But often when you ask, people are happy to share their story. How do you heard about us? Who told you? Oh, speak French and your anglophone. Where do you learn French? Oh, you were in immersion. And they, tell, they share the story. Sharing stories can be so powerful, regardless of the ministry. Tell us who you are. I'm interested. Instead of, I'm going to tell you what you have to believe. <laughs> I'm going to tell you who I am as the ordained minister of this congregation. No, tell us. I'm curious. And, and, and to build this culture of when someone new join, sometimes I'm the first one to say hello, but sometimes it's someone else from the congregation would say, oh, we have someone new, hello, how are you? Uh, how are you doing today? Is it wonderful or not? Is, is this, of course, we're a small number. If we were 100 people, eh, well, when we get there, we'll try to figure it out. But so far, we speak, we say, we say, we say, we advertise, we, we're doing advertisement on Facebook. We can criticize Facebook, the algorithm, but as Irene said, um, like the Roman build the roads to get the get the, the soldier faster to crush a rebellion, but Paul used the road to do ministry. Well, Facebook exists. Let's use it to our advantage. We're doing advertisement. Can an English speaking person participate in any activities? Gary. <laughs> Gary is here. Gary is coming every week to St. La. Gary is bilingual and, and better than you think, Gary. Just want to say that. But yeah, we have Francophone, we have Allied. Uh, sometimes I have people saying, you know, I want to see what you're doing. So do you understand French? No. Well, it's in French. He said, yeah, I just wanted to see how it is. Okay. But Gary, as an Anglophone, you want to say something? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, Gary, but since we know each other. That's okay. I, I can't even remember how I first heard about St. Clair, but I've been there since the beginning. And, and I do go to two services because I'm part of Trinity. I'm on the Council of Trinity Montreal, which is the partner church with St. Clair. So... Part of it was probably, at the beginning, curiosity to see what you were up to and, uh, and grew to like it. I, I love the interaction. I don't always have something to say, but I'm always listening and it's always interesting. Um, I, think, I think being able to understand French would, would help, for sure. Um, but everybody's welcome, for sure. Just to say, I put... Yes. Uh, Elizabeth, yes. Oh, yeah, I agree with Gary. I I uh, don't always understand everything, but um, the uh, the style of worship is very invigorating. So it's worth it's worth attending, yeah, and getting to see how it's done. Uh, I know we need to go because most of you have a real life. You're not ordained minister like me. In the chat box somewhere, if you look, there's my email. That's my phone number. If you want to talk, I'm always available for that. I'm always willing to, to hear about your stories, your question. Don't be shy. There's a website, www.idlissaintclair.org. I think it's at the top, almost at the top of the chat box. So, um, like I said, this email, uh, the, the website, the phone, it's so it can be used. So if you have, maybe you have other questions, maybe something will come later, contact me, I will be delighted. So back to Eric. Well, 
<clears throat> I think there is one last question if you wanted to answer that, uh, Stefan, before we wrap up. Um, it's about whether you would oh, answer Irene. a TikTok question, yes. <laughs> Oh, if someone uh, in English emailed you, would you able to answer in English? Yes, I'm trying to uh, answer in the language of people contacting me, well, French or English, but yes. And, and uh, I think it's, it's a question of respect. And, and, and since it's a ministry with people who are searching, uh, the emails are rarely simple. It's something like, Here's the question I have, and they have like 12 questions and not like, uh, what's the last name? Is Christ Jesus' last name? No, no, it's <laughs> it's really like, what is communion? And it's, and sometimes it's like, okay, <laughs> you have to go back to your old book, but I'm trying to answer everything in the language they contact me. Great. Well, Stefan, I think you are proof that uh, that what Carolina Costa said in our keynote is is correct. That it's often the minorities that help to reshape the majority, and and I think that this ministry is, uh, while it comes from a place of minority, there is no question in my mind that it is uh, having an influence on the rest of the church and and can have an influence on the rest of the church. So, thank you very much for your ministry. And thank you all for joining us uh, today. And we will um, uh, continue with our conversations uh, uh, that uh, there's a future session um, that's happening this evening, as well as, of course, the next two days. So look forward to seeing you in the rest of the conversations. And thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your presence. And